I've never been to Miami, but I've heard it's a very interesting place. Beautiful beaches, incredible nightlife entertainment, steeped in culture and history, a truly serene and relaxing experience. It's one of the world's premier vacation destinations. It's also the only city or location in the US in which the local football team has one quarterback for the first three quarters of a game and another quarterback for the final one. That's what I want to look at in a little bit more depth. What the hell is happening in Miami? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening guys, wherever you are in the world. This is CGTV Parlay, the channel where we talk topical issues, betting insights and analysis from the NFL, NBA and more. This is episode one. Without wasting any more time, let's roll the intro. So, the entire reasoning behind this topic comes from the weekend game against the Raiders. Brian Fitzpatrick goes for a toilet break in the fourth quarter, and when he returns, Brian Flores tells him he's going into the game, with the Raiders holding a 16-13 advantage. Until then, Tua's been solid, not lights out. His stats read 17 from 22, he's thrown 94 yards, with a 63.5 QBR and a 99.4 passer rating. It's not a performance change, it's a situational one. Fitz comes in with 947 left in the fourth. He throws nine from 13 for 182 yards. He's got a 92.2 quarterback rating and a 137.5 passer rating. He pretty much single-handedly wins the game. Uh, the crowning moment of which is a 34 yard pass wide open to Mac Hollins whilst his face mask is literally being torn off. And this isn't the only time it's happened. You know, we rewind to week 11 against the Broncos with 10.44 in the fourth quarter and Fitz replaces Tua again, this time with Miami 20 to 10 down. Tua's thrown 11 from 20 for 83 yards. He's got a 23.3 QBR and a 21.9 passer rating. So it's considerably worse than the Raiders game, but it's still not terrible. I think it landed up looking far worse because the run game wasn't helping the situation at all. By the time that they switched QBs, they had 15 carries for 50 yards. So at that time, the whole offense looked flat and Flores was just looking for a spark. Q Fitz, who throws 12 from 18 for 117 yards with an interception. He's got two drives. The first one takes Miami 43 yards and it ends up in a 53 yard field goal. And the second one is an 84 yard drive from the Miami one yard line to the Denver 15 yard line, which ultimately ends in an end zone interception. Miami go on to lose the game, but in this game, Flores gets the indication that Fitz can lead a team to at least a close finish. So when we kind of come to analyze the situation, the first thing that comes to mind is that Miami are an extremely fortunate team. I don't think that there are any other teams in the NFL that have two quarterbacks that understand the system as well as these two do and are both good enough and in good enough form to start. So it was after week six, the win against the Jets, going into the bye week, the Flores announced that Tua will be starting the next game. Miami were three and three, and this was a relatively unexpected move. It didn't seem to make a huge amount of sense at the time. We know that Tua was obviously the future of Miami, but he's just coming off what could have been a career-ending injury at Bama, and his first NFL start was gonna be against Aaron Donald and the Rams defense. It just seemed at the time to be an unnecessary swap, especially given that Fitz was playing pretty well. I think what Brian Flores saw though was opportunity. The Pats going into the Miami bye were two and three at the end of week six, and they're about to be two and four during the bye week, and Flores realized that there was a chance of making the wild card. 8-8, eight eight, which Fitz was technically leading them to, wasn't going to get them there. So Flores made the change in an attempt to shift this offense into another gear and make a serious claim for that spot. Tua played well, and has been playing well. He was aided by some pretty great defense against the Rams, and then he turned up and showed out against the Cardinals and the Chargers, showing that trademark efficiency and minimal turnovers that we saw with Bama. The Dolphins now sit 10 and five, so with hindsight, this was a great move by Flores and there really isn't much to counter that. But when you look a little bit more at the numbers behind both of these quarterback performances over the course of the season, we start to see why Miami have changed quarterback twice in the fourth quarter. Both these quarterbacks have very different styles of play and actually Amazon AWS Next Gen Stats gives us a really interesting view of this comparison. 
Tua has an average completed air yards figure of 5.4 yards, which ranks him 31 out of 43 quarterbacks with at least 128 pass attempts. Fitzpatrick, on the other hand, averages 6.5 yards for this metric, giving him the 13th rank amongst 43 QBs. Tua's average passing yards, which includes yards after carry, is 6.3. That ranks at 31 out of 36, according to ESPN. And Fitz ranks 8 out of 36, with 7.8 yards. And in fact, the only time Fitz, his average passing yards over the course of a season has been less than what Tua's has been this season, 6.3, was during his first three seasons as a starting quarterback in 2005, 2008, and 2009. Tua's USP is his ability to throw the ball with pinpoint accuracy into short, tight coverage situations. Next Gen Stats also has a metric called aggressiveness, measured as a percentage, which looks at how quarterbacks, how often quarterbacks attempt passes into tight coverage, specifically where there is a defender within one yard or less of the receiver at the time of completion or incompletion. Tua ranks at number two among all quarterbacks. He's got an aggressiveness percentage of 22.8. Fitzpatrick's USP is his vet experience and arm strength. He attempts and completes more deep passes than Tua, so when the game is on the line, he lands up being the more favorable candidate to lead the comeback. These stats are obviously heavily biased towards Fitzpatrick due to his experience, but his experience is also a factor that has to be in consideration here. Fitz has 18 game-winning drives in his NFL career. He's been in the league for more than 15 years, so is far more situationally aware in these kind of moments. He's more willing to take risks than Tua is, which is understandable given it's Tua's first season, but that's why he gets swapped out when the game is on the line. We have to eventually ask ourselves whether this situation is sustainable. And at the end of the day, the answer has to be no. Ryan Fitzpatrick is 38. He isn't always gonna be there to deliver a game-winning drive or a comeback in the fourth quarter. This is something that has to be eventually instilled into Tua's game. I don't think Tua has had a huge amount of help from his receivers this season, and that's a position that I hope they look to address in the draft. But what I'm also asking is, how long does this continue, and does it have the potential to stunt a young quarterback's growth? What does it tell a guy in his first year in the NFL if the coach tells you that he trusts you for three quarters but not for the fourth? For now, it works. I think this is far more a situational decision rather than a performance one. The Dolphins ultimately weren't expecting to be a playoff team at the start of the season, but now they have a genuine chance. They have to do whatever they can to get there. Brian Flores is ultimately not defined by how well he manages to groom a young quarterback, but solely on his record. The AFC East is suddenly an extremely competitive division again, and for many NFL coaches, short-term performance is make or break. When it comes to the situation in Miami, I don't see this being a long-term plan but I hope there's a game in the future that's slightly more expendable than the previous few and Flores gives Tua the chance to develop another side to his game. So that's what I see in Miami. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts and theories on this. We'll have many more episodes that come out in the following weeks, so keep an eye out for those. Depending on where you're listening to this, you can find us on YouTube, where we do a lot of video analysis on Medium, where we've got a bunch of interesting articles, or on Twitter, where we frequently post analysis from recent games. Until the next time, have a good one.